sharp questions must I shun, must separate constants from the nun. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. A palmer too, no wonder why. I felt rebuked beneath his eye. I might have known there was but one whose look could quell Lord Marmion. Well, some of you listeners, in fact, all of you, will recognize a couple of those lines that I just spoke about tangled webs of deception. But probably very few of you, and in fact, including me, until I researched this, know that those lines actually are from this full-length poem, book-length poem, by Sir Walter Scott about Lord Marmion. He was a deceitful courtier of Henry VIII, who tried to use a deceitful nun to win the hand of a lady he desired. Now, we will learn today of a twisted tale in the Sixth Circuit about perhaps some tangled webs of deception going on at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Now, were the Sixth Circuit judges the Palmers? A Palmer is a pilgrim to the Holy Land, as stated in that poem, who uncovered this deception at this place we know and love as FERC. Well, we're going to learn about that today on Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. So we got a little FERC coming on in a bit. And after that, we're going to get to some of our bread and butter qualified immunity Joining me today for these tales from the Sixth Circuit and the Third Circuit are IJ's own Bobby Taylor and Dan Nepper. Welcome to Short Circuit. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Happy to be here. Now, uh, Dan is our general counsel, and some of you may remember him from a past podcast where he talked about insurance. We bring him on for two things, insurance and FERC. I mean, two of the most exciting areas of law you can imagine. Maybe one day we'll we'll, we'll do another area uh, with him. So I'm excited to to talk about um, this case, and it involves separation of powers. There's a lot going on in this in this Sixth Circuit case in a bit. However, first we have a little bit of reader mail to catch up on. That uh, we got this email a couple of weeks ago from a listener who enjoyed our. Our uh, O'Scanlan O'Rama episode that had our uh, friends David Latt and Dan Sullivan, who both clerked for Judge O'Scanlan and worked in the Pioneer Courthouse in um, in Portland, Oregon. So this listener says, two weeks ago, I listened to Short Circuit episode 205, which is actually going back a couple years, in which the Tenth Circuit's library courtroom in Denver won the award for the most beautiful. Federal Circuit Courthouse. And some of you may remember that, that little competition we did a couple years ago. So he says, they won the award over my local Ninth Circuit Portland building, the Pioneer Courthouse. But then because he was interested uh, because of our episode in the Pioneer Courthouse, he did a self-guided tour while listening to the episode O'Scanlan O'Rama. He says he did not see Judge O'Scanlan, but he did see his office and he visited the library. So with all that said, and with the Tenth Circuit's library in, in mind, if you listeners don't know, it's a, it's just a, a courtroom like a lot of others in the Federal Circuit uh, Courts of Appeals, but it it's actually like is a library. So as you're arguing, you see all these books, you know, surrounding you on the shelves. It's very pretty. And so his question is, does anyone actually use the Federal Reporter and the federal supplement, which are district court opinions, found throughout the building in federal courthouses. Now, I'm guessing the books, like you know, in a public place, in a uh, in a hallway, no one actually used those. Those are for show. But in the actual courtrooms or in the actual chambers, does anyone pull those books off the shelves anymore and look at cases, or is that is it purely something people do online now? I gotta say, I think anyone my age and younger which includes Dan by just a, a smidgen of a, of a, of a year, um, does not do that. 
there may be some older folks, some older, you know, Johnson administration appointed judges out there who still do that, uh, maybe some younger than that. But I'm wondering, uh, Dan, especially, you know, in your younger days when you first started at a firm, were there older partners who still would legitimately, you know, look at the old case reporters? So I, there, you would, I, I recall people grabbing the annual versions of the CFR. Right. And so it's not quite the same, but but they, they, the CFR would come out every year and people would people would actually use those. I don't recall anybody doing good old fashioned like book case research ever. I, 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 I don't remember seeing that. But, Anthony, if I may, I have an aside. OK. So a couple of years ago in like 2018 or 19, um, a longtime friend of IJ had a was 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 in a, in a practicing attorney had decided to, to 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 reduce he was a solo practitioner decided to reduce kind of his footprint and that kind of stuff and he had at the time a complete set of Supreme Court reporters and he said I just can't bear to part with these right like can, can you find them a home and I said you bet and so we're talking like they, they were great condition the third you know the volumes with the beautiful bindings and all that kind of stuff you lightly used and at a time they, this was a valuable resource but but at, to your point like not a whole lot of people use them anymore right and so I I, I got those words started making phone calls and the pandemic hit and I, Anthony I couldn't find law, law, law libraries went to no prison libraries you. <laughs> Nobody was able to take receipt of this donation. We're, we're, we ended up using them and are using them for for around the office and that type of stuff, which I think is a perfectly fine use and, and you know that type of thing. But to, uh, no one, no one was even willing to take receipt of this donation. Wow, and that's Supreme Court report, and that was Supreme Court, and it was a complete set. It was it was gorgeous, uh, they, they, but it was, uh, but that was the extent. To, nobody nobody does that type of research anymore. Bobby, I'm curious. In in law school, did they teach you how to use the paper reporters or the Shepherd system? They did not, because they still when when Dan and I were in law school, at least my law school, they we still learned that. And I think the only time I actually did that was when I was taught how to do it in first year legal writing. They show you where the books are, but you're not really using them. It's all West now, Lexus. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure there are some folks out there, maybe maybe uh, a lawyers for old time's sake or uh, just never wanted to get around to a computer who who still read them. And God bless you if you're, you're doing it. Seriously, God bless you if you're doing that. But um, can't say it's a thing I do. But one thing I do do is read the Courts of Appeals online as they come out. And when this one came out, I knew it was something special, and I turned to our friend Dan Nepper. So, Dan, uh, what's what's the tangled web at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission? So we're in the, we're, we're in the we're in the Sixth Circuit. We're in the Sixth Circuit for this one. It's the Electric Power Supply Association versus FERC. It was argued in October 2023, and it was handed down. Decision was handed down on December 21st, 2023, which was the Thursday before Christmas when all the big news breaks. Uh, the question presented in this case is is was, was did the chairman of FERC exceed the authority? his authority in moving for voluntary remand of a rate making challenge that had been appealed to the DC circuit without support of other members of the commission. So, and, now, the, and, and basically in a nutshell, the FERC has several commissioners. The number varies depending upon appointees, whatever it's up to five. And the, the, rather than get a, a order from the commission, the chairman of FERC just sent the D.C. Circuit a note, a Circuit Court of Appeals a note that said, send this one back. That note happened to look, taste, smell, and feel exactly like a note that had been – exactly if it had been decided by the commission itself. And the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals said, sure, this ordinary course, here you go. And they went back to FERC, and the underlying decisions all changed materially upon voluntary remand. Um, and that that was that that whether that was appropriate is what was set up was, was what the Sixth Circuit had to decide. So I'm going to dive into the facts 
on this and it's electricity regulation and it, it's, it's complicated and there's acronyms everywhere. And so I'm going to do my best. But one of the things that I thought about when I studied this case was to keep the timeline in mind, right? Because even though all these things were going on, there was an awful lot happening in the, in, in, outside of this proceeding that I think merits paying attention to while, while, the, while this unfolds. So the you know, PJM is is the it was an intervener in the case. It was a PJM rate making case. So PJM is what's called a regional transmission organization, um, and the the, the 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 general gist of it is that in order for electricity to flow and get to the places where it needs to go, it 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 it, it goes from one generator one one utility to another utility, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't. So you have these regional transmission organizations that help to manage the, the that that electricity as it goes from one place to another. Um, this allows rather than having a utility to build as many generating generating facilities as it would need to meet its peak demand, right? Like the court talks about, we just get used to when we turn on a light switch, the lights turn on, right? But on in, in August, on a hot day in, in District of Columbia, right? Like there, that, that electricity's gotta be generated from somewhere. Rather than having all of that electricity be generated by by the local utility, who would only need the, those facilities, you know, in August and maybe you know September, or whenever there's peak load, you know, you can borrow excess generation capacity from other other utilities, other generating facilities all over the place, and managing that is what what PJM does. So PJM has to do a couple things to do that. They have to forecast demand. They have to identify the generating resources. They do a lot of things, but, but they also maintain reserves. So if, if something bad happens, PJM can, can make a phone call and the, the, the generating capacity that's needed to meet those demands is available to it. Um, and and, and that, that, that issue there, that question of maintaining reserves, is the actual source of the dispute in this case. So when it, when it maintains reserves, like PGM does so, and in, 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 I understand them to be tranches. Right? Step one: if your largest uh, if your largest generator collapses for some reason, you know you got a big plant out there that's generating a ton of electricity, like that they are able to replace that generating capacity within fifteen minutes, and and they pay they they pay an amount to to make that happen. And, and then the rest of the, if there's other blips in in the in the in in in, 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 the, in what's going on in the generating world. They have other types of reserves that are available to meet lesser lesser interruptions than than if than if one of the big generating units go, go, go goes offline for some reason. So the price cap for the big reserve if the big generator if the big generator goes offline, the price cap is eight hundred and fifty dollars per megawatt hour. Now. Over time, the markets had evolved, and regulators are involved in all aspects of it. And you know, the prices at which the other generators allowed to offer the price into the market, their electricity in the market changed, and so on. And it, it basically it doubled to to two thousand dollars per megawatt hour. This change in a, in that price made led PJM to believe that. It needed to be able to bid more for these emergency reserves than it currently was allowed to do so, because otherwise it might have difficulty obtaining the reserves it needs in 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 a, in a time of crisis, right? And so it went to it went to FERC because it, FERC needs to approve its rates, and said, "Hey, let's let's take that number to two thousand dollars per megawatt hour," and then and then they have some other thoughts about what to do with the, the lesser tranche of electricity, you know, what, what they can do and what, what they can bid into that space. Now, in practice, Anthony, like PJ, the court is clear, PJM often paid $0 per megawatt hour for the reserves because already generating plants weren't really necessarily generating at maximum capacity. You, a, a plant might be able to, to generate 100 megawatts per, per, we'll say, and it's only generating 50 at the time. And so if PJM needs more, it can get more from that additional 50. And that plant is just happy to produce that Electricity. That's right. right. That's right. And it's easy. It's relatively easy to do. Um, but PGM didn't believe that that was sustainable over time. Like they, they couldn't count on idle generation to be able to meet those to, to meet those demands. And so it wanted to be able to increase the price sh sh of that it was able to bid for. Should it have to go into market to get to get that electricity? And man, is this technical and complicated already? <laughs> right. Like, and so, but, but so the stepping back for a minute. 
the issue at this case is PJM, who is responsible for maintaining like reliable energy gener- supply in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, 10 other states in the District of Columbia, right? They wanted to be able to bid more for their energy than they were currently allowed to do in case of emergency. And that that was the question that went to FERC because that's what FERC does is they make that they make they make, they, they say that's OK or that's not OK. So March of 2019, PJM makes this rate request in February of 20, 2020 or sorry, May of 2020. FERC agrees with PJM and it, that the new rates are set to go in effect in May of 2022. There is a vigorous dissent in May of 2020 by Commissioner Glick that it, because everything gets litigated and relitigated in in this in rate making cases. There was a, a there was a request for rehearing. The rehearing was denied on no, in November of 2020, and it was promptly pro- appealed to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, where it was where, where the, the, the the FERC's decision to allow these price caps for PJM to bid more for these price cap for the, these reserves was going to be decided at the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. So in August of 21, so a couple, you know, not quite a, eight months maybe before the, the, the new rates were to go into effect, FERC sought voluntary remand to reconsider about 10 prior decisions that including, including this one. And I wasn't able to track down all 10 of those decisions as I was prepping for this, but I was able to track down some. There were a lot of PJM rate making cases in them, including one of them that had a degree of notoriety um, called the minimum offer price rule. Right. The minimum offer price rule was another one where where Commissioner Glick had dissented pretty vigorously. And the root of that case was whether whether generators who receive subsidies from the state for their generation should be allowed should should be able to use that subsidy to discount their auction price in, in when when they when they put their electricity out to bid or if they shouldn't be allowed to take that that subsidy into effect and they should have to bid something closer to what it actually costs to to generate the electricity or more simply understood anthony like should solar and wind generators, when they when they when they generate electricity, be be able to to offer it at a discount because they're receiving money in return for generating green electricity? Right. So it, essentially, it's do they have to set the subsidy aside and compete on you know as you might say a free market without the subsidy with other energy producers, or can they do they get the benefit of that? That's right. That's right. That's right. So um, in that instance, those who were in favor of green energy were disappointed by FERC's decision. And this was another one. And, and this one attracted some coverage in, in the, 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 the wider world outside of electricity. It was, it, it, that's why I, I picked on it here. Um, but, but this one was also accompanied by a vigorous d- dissent from uh, Commissioner Glick and was another one of the cases that was pulled back on voluntary remand. And, and this would have been in August 2021. And so, Dan, just to, the voluntary remand thing, just to make sure listeners are uh, get that part, is essentially the FERC, the commission, is the respondent – and the appelli, the appellants in the the people appealing are like you might call them pro renewable energy. So they're appealing. FERC is then you know on the defense, but then they say, oh okay, we'll remand and reconsider, and then maybe you guys who are opposed to us on this appeal will be satisfied with that, and we don't have to do all this stuff at the D.C. Circuit. And of course, they're going to say, okay, great, remand, and maybe you know we don't have to worry about what the judges will say. And is that essentially what's going on? Yeah, yeah, and in in the in the, the court, the, the appeals courts, as I understand, are happy to give these cases back, right? right? right. Like, like, and you know, it clears the docket, and it's not going to necessarily be a decisive turn in one way or another. It's going to be, hey, you know, we we something has come up, something has changed, we've become aware of something. We want to, we want to take a sec as an agency, we want to take a second look at this proceeding before it goes up to 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 the, the, the courts on to, to the courts on appeal. 
right? So this, so our case on the reserve price, along with several other cases, where sought voluntary remand, was the, the D.C. Circuit sent it back happily to FERC, where it would reconsider its its these decisions. And in our case, in particular, like the FERC changed course pretty much altogether. Said PJM had provided insufficient evidence to support the rate change, restricted it to eight hundred fifty dollars, the price it previously was, and then all of the all of these matters proceeded in due course at the FERC while as, a, as part after the volunt- after the FERC made decision re- reconsideration etc cetera, etc cetera. I believe it was in the end the, toward the end of 2021 but I'm not positive about that one of the other commissioners dissented from one of these decisions his name his name is Danley and Danley and Glick were kind of foils to each other they they both believe very strongly in in kind of FERC policy in those matters and their views were 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 rarely compatible with each other and and but it was in this dissent that that he, that Danley issued where he disclosed for the first time that maybe FERC hadn't necessarily asked for the voluntary remand but maybe it was just the new the new chairman Glick who who sent that note over to the courts, and then this appeal followed. Right, so we had a little bit of news getting broken. That's why the the argument hadn't come up before is because all the other participants were unaware that this request for voluntary remand did not follow was not an order of the commission or from the commission itself, but instead just from the pen of the, of the, of the new chairman. And, and this isn't really how things were supposed to go. So we're in the, we're in the Sixth Circuit, not the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeal. And why, why are we in the D.C. Circuit now? We're in the Sixth Circuit I, I'm now. sorry. In the D.C. Why, why is the appeal going a different route? Is that just because this is just one of the guys who was involved before guys, one, one of the energy companies – and they're based there, so that's why this appeal goes that way. I'm I'm not actually sure. I think I, I, I'm not actually sure why they picked the Sixth Circuit as opposed to the DC okay. Circuit, or it wasn't part of the. I I, I don't know that one. Um, I looked a little bit and, and didn't find didn't find a good answer. It could be as simple as home field advantage. Yeah. Right. Like like, but but I'm not I'm not entirely sure. So what's so. When now, now that this this issue is is teed up in the Sixth Circuit, the Sixth Circuit has to make a decision as to whether or not like this is it, it, you need quorum or an order of the commission or if a commission a chairman could just do this all by himself. And I gotta tell you, it didn't take them long. <laughs> They looked at the court. Looked at this. The court looked at the statute. It looked at practice. It looked at examples of what everything else does. Or all the other things that, that that FERC does, and then very kind of you know very quickly to said, hey, no, this 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 is impermissible. It looked at FERC's arguments for why this would be okay, and dare I say, it dispatched them. <laughs> huh? Very nice. Thank you. Um, and but then we get to the tough part of this case, and the tough part is remedy, right? So because now we're and we're just before Christmas in 2023, the the original decisions from FERC had been made and then appealed years before that, and nothing had stood still, and nothing had stood still in any of the remanded cases. And so, what do you do here? And the Sixth Circuit basically said, like, you know what? We're going to send this back to FERC. We're going to vacate that part of FERC's order claiming the chairman had authority to do this on his own. And we're going to leave the rest in place. And we're going to let FERC kind of decide whether they need to make any corrections or clean anything up on its own. So all they really said is, chairman, tisk tisk. Now go clean up your own mess. Right. And the dissent did not say, no, this was appropriate. You know, the chairman can do this. The dissent said, agreed, that the chairman absolutely can do this. But how is this possibly the remedy here? Right. Like this is this is a, both a, a substantive and a procedural fault. Like this needs to go back to the time where every, everything has happened since that point in time needs to be, be needs to be thrown out. And and it, it ta- you know, the dissent talked about how there were other mechanisms available to FERC if they couldn't get you know, the commissioners, the right thing to take, make it, but they're all harder, 
right? Like volunteer, like this is you know, this is the, the, there are there are ways that FERC could have managed this. They did not. They instead the chairman kind of went rogue, and and now in order to clean this up, we have to do more, or we ought to do more than just vacate that one part of the FERC order, right? Now, I don't. I, I, I did some research. I looked around. I tried to figure out, and my sense on this is that part of the problem is is that the, it was so widespread. It wasn't li- what happened. The the voluntary man wasn't limited to our case. That so much time had passed, and and so much many other things had happened in in these various dockets, not just this one, that to kind of reset the clock for two years was a. a bigger thing than 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 the court here might have been willing to to try and attempt to do it's the old putting the horse back in the barn problem right that's right that's right but but I, it, to me it, I, I was i thought the dissent was had the better of the argument you know this was you know if you think about it for even for a minute you know this was one person who spoke without authority for the commission to a federal court and then pulled 10 different proceedings back and proceeded to make different FERC proceed to make different rulings as makeup of the commission change and whatnot on on all of those underlying on all on all those matters. And that seemed to me to be something that that maybe the court should have found a, a, a remedy for appreciating that that would have been very difficult or created 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 some mess in, in, in some spaces. Bobby, my knowledge of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is basically what Dan has told me today, plus I had an unsuccessful interview with them once in law school, um, and I learned a couple tidbits from that. If you have any more knowledge than me, I, I would be curious in your your take of the case. My knowledge is limited to this case, but I have to say that I I was wondering as I was reading it, what else was going on here? I know they mentioned that there was an administration change and the commission basically turned over with the administration change. And uh, is it really that simple that this chairman Glick just found himself in charge now and wanted to enact policies that furthered, you know, a more green energy agenda or did he have it in for this PGM or what was the... So it's a great question. And and there's there was the the I looked in I I can answer it a little bit I can answer it a little bit, um, so there the, the, the prior to Glick becoming chairman there was you know, a, a, a person other than other than his foil other than his nemesis Danley was was not was not chairman and and that person Trump fired on the night of the election in 2020 as results were coming in. And he 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 appointed the 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 Danley the, the 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 nemesis as chairman of FERC, and and then Biden got be and was able to appoint a couple of other commissioners, and it did flip the the makeup of of the commission or the makeup, and he also then appointed Glick to chair. Um, Glick, Chairman Glick had a, a, a piece in Politico written about him that named him Biden's most effective, uh, most effective green warrior, I believe is, is what they called him. And he ended up, you know, Biden, Biden, President Biden tried to get his, Glick's term was set to expire. President Biden tried to get him appointed for another term. And um, it, that nomination was blocked by, by Senator Manchin because Glick wasn't just active in the energy regulator, the electricity space, but also proposed some 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 changes, some policies for pipelines that were um, not appreciated by the senator from West Virginia. And so I think that you know, there might have been some some I don't want to step into what people were thinking. I don't want to impugn any like lack of integrity. Thing. You know, I bet I bet Chairman Glick thought PGM was not founded in its rate request. Right. I, I mean, I, I don't doubt that um, there is a there is a, a a definite theme in the rulings and, and policies and things like that, that that have come out of FERC in, in that in, over the last year and a half or so. Dan, one re- re- to, to be a bit charitable here, one reading I had of the case is that, yes, it does seem I mean, 
definitely just the chairman acted alone in the past. This has been a commission decision whether to to ask for voluntary remand in one of these cases. It does seem like Judge Sutton's probably right about the 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 reading of the statute. But could the could he have been thinking at this point people on his side controlled the commission? So if he had had a vote of the commission as to whether to do voluntary remand, he would have gotten it. This is this really is just a paperwork thing. And it maybe they would have remanded, you know, not until their next time they were able to meet, but it didn't change anything in the in this even in the short run, let alone the long run. Um, that might be right, Anthony. I'm 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 not one of the things that the court made clear in its opinion that I think cuts against that is that there was a question as to whether PJM timely raised its arguments, right? Because the, the, the voluntary remand had occurred so much earlier, right? Before before it came before this came to light, right. and I, I wonder what type of back and forth there would have been if the commission had sought voluntary remand at the time, right? If this had you know presumably if it's a paperwork thing, then this lawsuit would have just been filed quicker. Right. Or or something along those lines. But um, it did seem to, to, to it seemed to me that the as much as it was maybe to ease the paperwork, there was definitely a sneakiness about it that that the court didn't like. Well, we will leave any more sneakiness with FERC to another day, but very much appreciate Dan um, taking us through that tangled web of energy regulation and in a little bit of separation of powers. We're now going to move to the third circuit where we have something a, a bit more straightforward for folks to wrap their heads around. And that is uh, police exercising their powers in a way that violates clearly established law. So Bobby, uh, take it, take us to this story of an, an unwelcome visit to uh, a house uh, one night. Uh, yes, this is out of the Third Circuit. This is the home of Richard and Ada Engelmeyer. They live in uh, Bangor Township, Pennsylvania, which is near the Poconos. And uh, the district court opinion indicates that they live on 60 acres of land. And in addition to the main house, there are several structures. So we're talking about kind of a, a compound in the in the middle of nowhere. So uh, Richard and Ada are 77 and 76, and they live in the home with several family members, uh, including their sons, Jeffrey and Mark, and their son-in-law, Joseph. Mark, who is 52 years old, is suspected of dealing methamphetamines out of one of the premises on the property. So at 6 a.m. on February 23rd of 2018, the Pennsylvania State Police decide that they're going to send 43 officers to this home to essentially effect a, a raid, and they're looking for Mark and the drugs that he is suspected of selling. Home at the time are 77-year-old Richard and 76-year-old Ada, their son Jeffrey, and their son-in-law Joseph. Mark is not home. Uh, Richard, the husband, is asleep in the living room at the time. He's 75 years old. He's awoken by lights outside. And knowing that they live in a rural area, he thinks, is there a fire? What's going on? He walks to the window and looks outside. When he looks outside, the officers see him and realize that their operation may be compromised. So at that point, they storm the house. So starting with Richard, he's the first person they encounter. When they open the door, Richard is in the process of walking out of the door. So they meet him in the living room. An officer shines a flashlight into his eyes. All indications are that Richard is, is complying. They haven't said anything to him yet. And they just approach him and strike him in the head with the flashlight, grabbing his neck, forcing him to the ground, causing him to hit his head on the fireplace, rendering him briefly unconscious and tearing something in his knee. He needed surgery. Next is Ada. They encounter Ada. She was sleeping in the first floor bedroom and she's 76 years old. They say that she's a woman of small stature. She was dressed only in a nightgown. She wakes up and she steps outside into the hallway where she is met with the shield 
of one of the officers. Uh, Officer Painter smacks Ava in the face with a shield, causing her to fall backwards. She breaks several teeth and a vertebrae. And the facts, as alleged, are that Officer Painter gave no warning and no instructions to Ada before he struck her. Next is Jeffrey. Uh, Facts indicate that Jeffrey was also sleeping in the living room next to his father. When he woke up to the commotion of the police raiding his house, he walked into the kitchen to try to figure out what was going on. When he got to the kitchen, uh, an officer McGarvey shouted at him to get down. And before he could comply, officer McGarvey clotheslined him and forced him to the ground. Another officer put his boot on Jeffrey's neck Uh, zip-tied him, pulled him up by the zip-ties, shoved him in a chair. At this point, he notices, uh, my parents are badly injured. Can someone call for an ambulance? And he is slapped in the face and repeatedly punched. Seems like these cops kind of have one M.O., like one trick they just kind of use over and over again. It it does, and it, it, it... ends with Joseph. Uh, Joseph is upstairs. Now, he's 45. He's the son-in-law. So arguably, he's the one that maybe, arguably, they could mistake for their 52-year-old suspect. But they walk into his bedroom. They jump on the bed. They proceed to zip-tie him, pick him up, and throw him to the ground. So yeah, again, just they're they're doing the same thing to all of these people uh, to try to subdue them. Mark's not home. They find no drugs in the home, and Mark is not charged with any crime as a result of this raid. So the four plaintiffs that were home and that were beaten by the police, uh, they sue, alleging an excessive force claim, uh, violation of the Fourth Amendment. Now, the district court opinion at the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and the Third Circuit says this in their opinion, The district court relies heavily on the officer's version of events and grants the officer's summary judgment. Uh, The officers had moved for summary judgment, and what you're supposed to do on a summary judgment motion is take the facts in favor of the non-moving party. So by by kind of siding with the officers, the district court made made a mistake there. And, And it's interesting, if you read the district court's opinion, it is very deferential to the officers. It talks about how the officers testify to things and the plaintiffs only allege them. (laughs) And it talks about how this family uh, is known to be hostile to law enforcement. Uh, It is known that they have firearms in the home legally. Um, But it's just, it, it paints the picture very differently than the third circuit does when it tells the facts in a way that is very deferential to the officers. And in the district court, um, they they only get to the first prong of the qualified immunity analysis, which is, is there a violation of a constitutionally protected right? And while they agree that the Engelmeyers have a right to be free of excessive force, in the district court, they say, from the perspective of a reasonable officer, the force used was not excessive, that these officers were justified in doing what they did because they had reason to believe that these uh, people posed a threat. As to Jeffrey and Richard, because they can't allege with uh, sufficient particularity which officers actually hit them, their claims fail uh, and all of the claims are, are dismissed by the district court. So the Third Circuit gets the claim on appeal, and what I like about this decision is that they really do a good job of engaging with the facts of the case. Um, We say at IJ all the time that facts matter, and I think that the judge here really took that to heart. Um, They talk about, first of all, the the two prongs of the qualified immunity analysis, and and to resolve the first prong, they they go the opposite way of the district court where they, they say that... Yes, the Engelmeyers have a right to be free of excessive force. And yes, the force here, at least a reasonable fact finder could find that the force here was excessive. They go plaintiff by plaintiff and they talk about how Ada is 76 years old. She's small. She's in a nightgown and you haven't said anything to her yet. And you're hitting her in the face. 
and they go through Richard's situation where, again, he's he's complying, he's following the flashlight with his eyes, and then all of a sudden he's hit in the face with the flashlight. In terms of Jeffrey, he is punched in the jaw and slapped in the face after he is zip-tied. So he's restrained. He doesn't pose a threat. And then same thing with Joseph. He's upstairs in the bed and he's zip tied and then thrown to the ground. Um, So what the court says is that taking, you know, all of the facts and even, even the disputed facts in terms of which officer struck Richard and which officer struck Jeffrey, those are questions for a jury, not to be resolved on summary judgment. And it was wrong to decide those facts in the officer's favor. But that's only the first prong. Uh, the second prong of the qualified immunity analysis is that not only do you have to find a violation of a constitutional right, you have to find that that right was clearly established at the time of the officer's conduct. And the way to do that is through uh, prior case law. The precedent cases have to be sufficiently factually analogous to put a reasonable officer on notice that his conduct was unlawful. And the the Third Circuit talks about the fact that in order to be clearly established, uh, the specificity of case law is especially important because the question needs to be beyond debate for these officers. Luckily, in the Third Circuit, there is a case that they found to be sufficiently analogous, although when we go through the facts, you'll see that I think, I think if they wanted to, they could have found some factual distinctions. But uh, in Cowden v. Duffy, it's a case out of Delaware, uh, the police arrive uh, uh, hunting down a, a suspected drug dealer. The police arrive to the home and see two doors down a young male run into a different home. And they say, that must be our suspect. He must be trying to flee. And they chase this man into the home and they uh, don't realize that this is just 14-year-old Adam Cowden, who is dropped off by his mother and runs into the home to pick up his sister. So his mother gets to watch this happen. Uh, The officer's storm into the house, grab Adam, throw him to the floor, press their knee into his back, pushed his head into the ground, and spray him with mace. And the court in Cowden found that Adam was unarmed, there was no reason to suspect he was a threat, and that this force was unreasonable. I found it interesting that, you know, the, the, the Third Circuit here could have said, well, that was a 14-year-old, this is a 76-year-old, and that's just the kind of factual distinction that makes this not clearly established. But they didn't do that. Um, They said that Cowden's rule is that it is unlawful for an officer to engage in serious bodily harm when the individual posed no danger and did not resist to attempt to flee and was not armed. So based on the the precedent case law, the right to be free from this kind of excessive force was clearly established, and the Engelmeyer's claim gets gets to a jury, which I think is a really good decision for two reasons. Um, one, it, in the world of qualified immunity, where in order to, to get a denial of qualified immunity, you need clearly established case law. More cases that deny qualified immunity are better for just people in general. And then also, I really liked how the judge uh, engaged with the facts and uh, didn't just kind of take the officer's word for it as the district court had done. Dan, did uh, the actions of these police officers seem like a clearly established violation of the law to you? It ought to be, right? One would think. If you listen when you listen to these the the, the facts the fact patterns and the facts of the case and you it, you know Bobby thought you made a really nice point of like you know making sure you take it in the perspective of the folks who are are the the, the folks who were who suffered at the suffered at the hands here you know like, you I, I can't help but think of like the amount of time that had passed you said that the gentleman need sur- needed surgery you know. Yeah, by the time the Third Circuit got done, how like that, that that had to be a couple of years that went by, right? Right. So this happened in 2018, the incident, yeah. and and this was argued in September of 2023, and it was just decided or just filed last February or last week. So I mean, this is almost five years now. 
And and that's just to now get to a jury. Right. So now they have to have the trial and then there'll be an appeal and God knows when they'll actually get compensated. Well, hopefully hopefully it'll it'll go their way. We'll I I really uh like your point about that prior case being a case that if the judges wanted to, they totally could have distinguished it. I mean, listeners may remember there was a, a slew of these uh, qualified immunity uh, uh, cases that went to the Supreme Court about four years ago now that a lot of us thought the court was going to take to really take on qualified immunity. And some of them were these these crazy distinctions, uh, such as a person, a cop shot a dog, but the uh, the dog was it it, it wasn't in the, the same kind of circumstance as another dog shooting case, and so it could d- distinguish this too. Um, there was b- b- police brutality against someone who was lying down, or I think it was sitting up, but the prior case was the person was lying down, and so they distinguished it. And here, this was, I mean, it was, you, you write about someone running into a house who wasn't even the person they were looking for. These police officers knew these people would be in the house. They just, you know, brutalized them way beyond what was reasonable. Um, but at least that's a distinction. And it was a, it, it was a child. It was a minor. And all of these people were not children. So they could have done it in all kinds of ways. But instead, you, just, you get the common sense distinction that you wish the Supreme Court would mandate courts to actually do, which is, yeah, they beat this person up for no, for no good reason. And you can't beat people up for no good reason. Well, and the other thing that's good about a case like this is it does have those those kinds of facts that if the Supreme Court were looking for a good case to take up, if if you know if the officers were to appeal this decision, I think that these might just have the anger-inducing facts that are needed to get the justices to to consider. That's that's a, a good point. Uh, it it is it is hard to root for the Supreme Court taking a case about qualified immunity because. Usually the rule is the <laughs> the the plaintiffs lose <laughs> when qualified immunity goes to the Supreme Court. Although there were a couple of sep- uh, exceptions a couple terms ago that that we have talked about before, where there were some summary reversals where things just got way out of hand and uh, and there was a signal to, to to try to not be so literal about this this type of um, uh, uh, adhering to precedent, but. Uh, Maybe times are going to change soon. We uh, we will see. Well, thank you both for this tour of FERC and um, qualified immunity, Dan. We will we will keep abreast of further developments in in this area and this this uh, Shakespearean saga that's going on at the commission. And uh, when there is more news, perhaps we'll uh, uh, we'll 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 put the Dan signal out for you to come back. I, I look forward to it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you both. Thank you both. And thank you all for listening. And until next time, I hope that all of you get engaged. Mm-hmm.